What does Advent mean? Advent is more than just the chocolates you eat every morning when you wake up. Advent means the arrival of something or someone notable. And obviously as Christians, we believe that the most notable person in all of human history arrived on earth in this back end town, otherwise known as Bethlehem, 2000 years ago. And when you think about it, everyone in the Old Testament was awaiting his arrival. Like they were looking forward to the coming Messiah, the savior of the world, on whose shoulders the government would rest. They were waiting and they were waiting. But the Christian faith isn't just about looking back. You know, we don't just look at that advent and go, Jesus came 2000 years ago. The Christian faith looks forward. And so we acknowledge that Jesus came 2000 years ago. And obviously we celebrate that reality. But we also live with this understanding and faith that Jesus is coming back. And so we're still in a time of waiting in many ways. When Jesus came the first time, he came to, you know, nullify the power of sin and to make a way back to the Father. But when he comes the second time, he's coming to right the wrongs, to wipe away every tear and to call the church to himself and really the party begins and so you know when you think about it we are waiting in hope for a coming day where Jesus returns I don't know if you've seen those um, those mini poems on the gram recently or on any social media kind of channel that you're on it's an interesting thing because like there's these mini mini poems that try to evoke that sense of feeling when something's about to happen and I think it's great listen to this it's the hush in the theater between the house lights going down and the curtain going up. It's the turning off the lights before you bring in the birthday cake. It's the conductor raising his baton and tapping it on the lectern before the orchestra takes a collective breath and starts the symphony. It's the little holiday faces pressed against the car window in order to be the first one to see the sea. It's refugees in a sinking raft spying the lights of the lifeboat on the horizon. These moments captured speak of this anticipation of something happening that is gonna change everything. And I think ultimately it speaks to hope. And like, it goes without saying that when you look at the world right now, the world needs hope. You know, to be honest, when you look at the church, the church needs hope. And maybe if you're brutally honest, you need hope. There's this soundbite in the book of Job that I think often gets breezes over because it's one of, uh, it's spoken by one of his friends that altogether isn't overly helpful, but does speak some truth as he's speaking to Job. And this is the soundbite that he says. He says, those who forget God have no hope. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? It's quite insightful. Those who forget God have no hope. And so you may be wondering, why is the society and culture in which we live becoming increasingly hopeless? Well, to be honest, I think it's because society and culture is becoming increasingly godless. You know, when you have no God in your story, you become the centerpiece of your story. It all hinges on you, what you can achieve, the successes you can enjoy, um, the things that you can make right and correct. You know, if you don't believe in God, then government is the best stab at transformation that we have in society. You see, when we push God out of the equation of life, Actually, what we also do is push hope out of the equation of life. There's this well-known quote that goes something like this. You can survive weeks without food, although I'd struggle, right? You could survive days without water. You can survive minutes without oxygen, but you can't even survive a second without hope. It's an interesting quote and I appreciate that it's not totally accurate, but what it does speak to is the essential nature of hope to the human condition. 
Hope is so paramount to our well-being, our mental health, the way we look after our physicality, the way we cultivate our marriage and raise our children. Hope is a central component to our existence. I came across this study and it sounds pretty brutal, uh, but it's interesting, right? I'm just gonna stand still so, so I explain it right. There was this well-known psychologist many years ago, okay, uh, by the name Kurt Richter. And he took about 12 rats, okay, and he put them in a barrel of water. And within two minutes, like those rats may have swam on the surface, some of them, some of them swam down to look and assess the situation. But by the two minute mark, all of them had drowned and died. Right, it's a brutal experiment if that was the extent of it, but it isn't. He then gets another um, gang of rats. <laughs> I don't know what the collective name for rats is. Rat eye, ratty. Uh, he gets another group of rats and he exposes them to the same environment. He puts them in the same barrel of water and he leaves them. But before the two minute mark, when he begins to notice and see their distress, he pulled each one out, gave it a breather, kind of helped it to restore its lung capacity and then put the rat back into the environment again. Now what's really interesting about that is the second group of rats that were able to come out before they gave up the fight, when they went back into the water, they swam for days. They swam for days and it's an interesting thought because his observation was this, as a secular psychologist, was it wasn't their ability that had developed or improved in such a short window of time, it was their grip on hope that maybe this barrel wasn't going to be their end and that maybe someone would lift them out. In fact, he says this in his findings and in his final thesis. He wrote, The situation of these rats scarcely seems one demanding fight or flight. It is rather one of hopelessness. The rats are in a situation against which they have no defence. They seem literally to give up when the rats quickly learn that the situation is not actually hopeless and that after the elimination of hopelessness, the rats do not die. What is Kurt trying to say in this moment? What he's trying to say is that hope is a game changer. Hope changes everything. Okay, so we have to ask the important question, what is hope? How do you define hope? You know, typically in the world, we've reduced the word and our understanding of hope to something that we want to happen. You know, I hope I get an iPad for Christmas. I hope Bournemouth get promoted back to the Prem. I hope the weather's nice tomorrow. And that's really the extent in which we use the term hope. But hope is so much more than that. You know, in some cases, you know, we've reduced hope to optimism. You know, if we're just optimistic, then that's the same as being hopeful. I don't know if you've seen that uh, video that's gone viral on the socials. And um, it's a chap who has taken the word Omicron B, obviously the current variant that we're battling uh, as a world right now. Um, Omicron B, I think it's 0.1.1592 or something is its accurate name. Well, he takes Omicron B and he, he kind of reshuffles the letters and realizes that Omicron B can also be spelt no crimbo, <laughs> okay? No crimbo, I mean, he may be a bit of a conspiracist, but like just that this Omicron B can also be, when shuffled, these letters can spell no crimbo. Uh, no crimbo. And you know, it's kind of funny. I find it funny anyways, you may not. Um, but I was at my small group the other night and Danny, someone in our small group, he says, well, if you're an optimist, it could mean crimbo on. And I love that. I was like, yes, it totally could mean crimbo on. And I think that's the interesting thing about optimism. Optimism is a great trait in a person. I love being around optimistic people. In fact, I consider myself to be an optimistic person most of the time. But optimism is not the same as hope. And I'll tell you why. Optimism is psychological, okay? It's to do with the mental faculty. It's to do with your mind. So optimism is psychological, but hope is theological. And it's an interesting and important kind of differentiation. Also, um, optimism, if you like, is about 
What can I do about this situation? How can I think differently about this situation? Whereas hope kind of asks the question, what is God going to do about this situation? And also when you think about it, optimism is often the denial of reality. Whereas hope doesn't deny reality, hope embraces reality and understands that this is the situation, but yet God can still do something about it. Hope is not the same as optimism. So what does the Bible say about hope? So in the Bible, there are three different forms of hope. There is, first of all, wishful hope. And it really speaks to how we generally understand hope by the world standards, what I wish would happen, okay? So wishful hope, like, um, I, I wish, I wish Bournemouth would stop losing all of these games and turn their season around, okay? It's a wish for hope. I can't do anything about it, but I wish something would change. The second sort of hope in the Bible is expectant hope. Okay, so expectant hope may look like this. Um, I'm gonna become a coach at Bournemouth and I'm gonna invest some of my time and effort so that I can be expectant about Bournemouth's prospects going forwards. Uh, you know, in the Premiership. I'm, I'm not sure they would employ me, to be honest. But like, if you want, wish for hope is like wishing, I wish there was tomatoes in my garden tomorrow, okay? Expectant hope is, I'm gonna plant seeds today, and then tomorrow, there'll be tomatoes, hopefully, okay? Hopefully, I hope there'll be tomatoes in light of the actions I've taken. The third type of hope is different to the first two. And it's the one that really is most important and the one that I really want to address right now and it's certain hope. And it's different because it's nothing about what you can do, but it's about what God is doing and what God will do in light of his promises. This idea that God has promised certain things in the scripture, we can read them, okay, and he will fulfill them because he's faithful to fulfill his promises. And so in those promises, we can have a certain or a confident hope regardless of whether I do these things or not, that God is going to fulfill his promises. And it's an interesting thought because so often we reduce hope, like I say, to this idea of wishing something was better. But actually, as we get into the scriptures, we can discover that there are promises and prophecies that God has spoken, even about the return of Christ, that can speak to our mentality and outlook and shape the decisions that we make, even this Christmas time, based on what God will do. We can have a certain and confident hope. I love what Paul says to the church in Rome, in Romans 15, verse 13. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul is saying in this passage that peace and joy are the manifestation of the hope that exists in your life. And how do we get hope? We go to the source of hope, God himself, and then we will overflow with hope. Hope finds its home ultimately in the Christmas story. You know, when you think about the, the, the whole narrative of the Christmas story, Joseph, Mary, the shepherds, the wise men, um, Zachariah and Elizabeth, all of these various characters contributing to the narrative that we read every Christmas. And um, we, we see that in some way, hope manifests somewhere in their posture and in their story. For example, Mary and Joseph, it was about holding on to promise every day. There must have been days where they doubted. There must have been days where they struggled. There must have been days where they were like, had big questions about the calling that God had given them. I mean, it was huge. You've spoken about that over the last few weeks. Yet hope for them looked like them holding on to promise every day going back to the promise and trusting that they could have a confident hope that it would come to pass because the word that they received did not originate with man, it originated with God, the source of hope. When you think about the Magi, you know, the astronomers or often in our carols and in our children's stories, the three kings, the long journey they had to endure, they traveled for literally years 
to bring their gifts, to bear their gifts to the Messiah, to the Saviour. Not only that, they had to circumvent the power of the day. Herod, who was insecure and worried about the arrival of this new king that was born, king of the Jews. And so, like, Herod tried to, if you like, derail the Magi's desires to go and meet the Saviour. And so, you know, for me, when I think about the Magi, I think about the fact that for them, hope looked like this, having ongoing peace to endure. They had to continue the journey. They had to, no matter what it took, to go around Herod in order to preserve the life of the Saviour. And they had to search the Saviour out. You know, so often we think that maybe, um, you know, the, the, the wise men, the Magi rocked up, um, you know, at Jesus' birth within like four hours. But it was probably a year or two after Jesus arrived that they actually showed up. And then finally, I think about the shepherds who had that angel visitation. And when you think about the predicament of the shepherds, the fact that by society standards, they were considered like criminals, like outcasts. And yet for them, the angels appeared and the shepherds became the first evangelist who went and told the, other ta the rest of the town that Jesus like, had come. And so hope for them looked like helping other people everywhere encounter Jesus. You know, I think when we truly get our grip on hope, it changes the way we live and it also changes the way we die. Early this week, I had the privilege of visiting a Sunny Hill legend, a very popular lady of Sunny Hill, otherwise known as Sue Price, who many of you know by now that, you know, we're not sure when she's going to come to the end of this life but we know that she's battling a very terminal and serious illness. And I sat with her for a couple of hours and the peace and joy she emanated from her core was inspiring. It was inspiring. And you know what, as I spoke to her, I asked her like, you know, how was she feeling and what was she thinking? And I said, what's your favorite scripture? What's your favorite Bible verse? Because I think sometimes, you know, you need a promise to navigate challenging seasons. So you always need a promise to navigate problems. But she said, it's John 14, verse one. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. And I realized that the reason that she had this peace and joy was because it emanated from her grip on hope. She had hope that this was not the end. This was just the beginning. And I left feeling so inspired. And this is the thing for you guys this Christmas. You can have that hope. You can experience that hope. It's available for you and it's available for me. And so I want to challenge you uh, over the next week. You know, when maybe you're struggling with life, feeling overwhelmed by all the pressures and all the problems, and there's plenty to go around, isn't there? I want to challenge you to hold on to the promise every day. The promise of the fact that God is in control, but also the fact that Jesus is coming back. That's a great promise to hold on to. I want you to have ongoing peace to endure. How do you get peace? We've spoken about that a couple of weeks ago at Paul Campus. You get peace, the, the peace of God, by having peace with God. Okay, so get right with God during this Christmas season. And then finally, once we hold on to the promise every day and have ongoing peace to endure, we can help other people everywhere, which is really the mandate of the commission, isn't it? Go into the world. So this Christmas, I challenge you, don't just keep this hope to yourself. Share it, take it, speak about it, show people it. Show people this reason for hope that you have. His name is Jesus and the hope he brings is a game changer to humanity.